good evening, everyone. I'm doing the acknowledgement of country. So I'm here in Perth, Western Australia. I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we gather today, the Wadjuk people of the Noongar tradition, uh, the Noongar nation. I pay my respects to the elders, past, present and emerging, for they hold the memories, the traditions, the culture and hopes of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples across this nation. The Australian Cardine Institute community commits to building a brighter future together. I now hand over to Pat. Thank you, Gemma. It's our custom whenever we have gatherings uh, organised by ACI to follow the acknowledgement of country uh, with the YCW prayer. And so now I invite you to join with me in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, a worker like me, help me and all my fellow workers to think like you, to work with you, to pray through you, to live in you, to give to you all our strength and all our time. May your kingdom come in all our factories, workshops, and offices, and in all our homes. Be everywhere better known, better loved, better served. Deliver us forever from injustice and hatred, from evil and sin. May our souls remain in your grace today, and may the soul of every worker who died on labour's battlefield rest in peace. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks very Thanks much. Thanks very much. Pat, yeah. oh, sorry, I'll just introduce you, Bishop Eugene, before I hand over to you. Um, yes, so Bishop Eugene, I've known him for quite a long time now, not as far back as when he was ordained as a priest in 1964. But anyway, I did meet him when he was um, bishop in uh, Darwin about 15 or 16 years ago. And I well remember going with him in a car and we stopped off to, to have some contact with uh, local Indigenous people living in Darwin. And that's one of the areas I know he's been very much involved in over his ministry, particularly in the Northern Territory, but no doubt also in his previous ministries in the Diocese of Port Perry from where he originally came and where one of the things he began with was as a YCW chaplain uh, some time ago. I'm sure he'll be able to tell you more about that. Uh, more recently, um, I think he's been made a member of the Order of Australia for his service to the church. And uh, um, he was nominated as a Senior Australian of the Year in the Northern Territory in 2022. But um, as, I'm, as I'm sure you're about to hear, he's still very active in so many different ways up in the Northern Territory. And I'm sure you'll all list, enjoy very much listening to what he's got to say. So, Bishop Eugene, I'm handing over to you. Um, who's got the prayer up on the screen? And we have to take that That's down. Oh, oh, you've got it. Great. All right, then. So your screen's up and ready. Handing over to you now. Thanks very much, Bishop Eugene. Good. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for this great privilege of uh, getting together. It's mind-blowing in a way, the, uh, the, whole, <laughs> the whole concept of being able to uh, talk to so many people all around the world. It's just amazing. Uh, <clears throat> and I suppose where we ought to start is, is maybe it's just my age, but I'm beginning to think a lot lately about the incredible gift that life is. It's such a precious gift, and it might be good for us to just reflect upon that for a moment. Uh, it's something that we can't make for ourselves. We can't buy it, can't demand it. Uh, I guess it's something of a mystery. We know it's true, but we have no idea of why, my, why me, because if I was just a little bit different, I'd be someone else. Um, and I guess that the church teaches us and hopes that our response to this gift of life uh, is our way of showing thanks to God. And so for all of us, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, the question is, well, what, what do I do with this precious gift? And 
the things we're talking about tonight remind us that the church, through baptism, sanctifies this extraordinary gift of life and makes it holy. So for all the baptised, the way's mapped out for us. And great emphasis is given to this in Lumen Gentium, or the Light of the Nations, um, published in the Vatican II documents in 1964. And it's an interesting, interesting coincidence that I, I was ordained in 1964 and I spent uh, all my study uh, preparing uh, for um, a pre-conciliar church and then I've spent my, my whole life as a priest in the post-conciliar church. So it was a time of enormous change um, in, in outlook. And uh, I suppose it's one of the great gifts to the church and certainly to me and my priesthood. Um, and Lumen Gentium has powerful things to say. Um, it says... Uh, the faithful, by baptism, are incorporated into Christ, are placed in the people of God in their own way, sharing the priestly, prophetic and kingly office of Christ, and to the best of their ability, carry on the mission of the whole Christian people in the church and in the world. Extraordinary um, outline of the dignity uh, of the vocation of the lay, lay person. And it probably prior to Lumen Gentium, there was a sense, I think, that real holiness was limited, you know, to uh, people in uh, monasteries and things like that. Um, the... Uh, uh, Lumen Gentium makes it clear the difference from that. Um, the faithful by baptism are incorporated into Christ, placed in the people of God in their own way, sharing the priestly, prophetic and kingly office of Christ and to the best of their ability, carry on the mission of the whole Christian people in the church and in the world. Father Ron Rollheiser suggests that Christian theology has generally been a bit weak in its treatise on marriage uh, and the vocation of lay persons in the world. Um, he says, somehow the earthiness of the incarnation, so evident elsewhere, has been slow to spill over into our thinking about marriage, sex and the family. He goes on to say there are reasons for this, of course, among them the fact that often those writing books on marriage are themselves not married, but celibate monks and nuns. And any priest who's worked in a parish or with any lay group will testify uh, to the inspiration that lay people and especially families are. I want to say more about that a bit later on. Married life certainly serves as the domestic church the school of search, social virtue and the primary or vital cell of society, says Lumen Gentium. It's pretty clear where Lumen Gentium and the Second Vatican Council places um, the, uh, the, the truth uh, of our baptism. And I suppose one of the clearest expressions of this truth occurred for me when I visited an Aboriginal community when I first came here as the Bishop of Darwin. Um, I'd had a lot to do with Aboriginal people in, in uh, my life as a priest, one way and another, uh, playing sport against them and having great friends among them. And then when I became the Bishop of Port Piri Diocese, I had the Pitted Njara lands, immense area in the north of South Australia. But pretty much all of the Indigenous people there were not Catholics. Uh, I would go to the uh, lands and meet with the people there. And uh, when I'd meet them somewhere in Cooperpedia or wherever, they would say, oh, you're that God man. So we knew we had a relationship, but it was 
it was not as Catholic bishop and Catholic uh, people. And so uh, when I came here to the Diocese of Darwin, I, uh, I sat down at Watt Airport Keats, which is a community of about 3,000 people uh, near the Western Australian border on the coast of North Australia. And uh, I sat down with uh, Theodora, who was the elder there at that time. She's now in heaven. And I said, Theodora, you know, I'm new here and, and I, I don't know what you would want me to say about you or with you or for you. Do you want me to speak for you? How do I uh, do what you want me to do? I'm, I'm not sure. Can you help me? And so Theodora said yes, that they would have a little meeting, a little talk, and then called me in and sat me down and said, Bishop, we've talked. You asked us how you should uh, go about talking with us or about us, for us or whatever. We've talked, and this is really what you need to know. And she said, the first thing you need to know, Bishop, about us is that we are a Catholic people. And I went to say, well, you know, that's great. And then she stopped me and she said, no, hang on, Bishop. She said, that's not what we are. That's who we are. And it knocked me over. I couldn't think of another parish, another community that would define themselves that way. Uh, Bishop, that's not what we are. That's who we are. The uh, it 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 was the it wasn't a label. It was their very being, and it it challenged me to understand Lumen Gentium that that this is what baptism really meant. This is what baptism looked like, um, and so. Um, we continued on in those uh, uh, conversations and uh, I've been incredibly grateful for the lessons I've learned uh, from Aboriginal people in all sorts of places. Um, riding my bike each night as I try to do for all these years out among what we call the long grasses, people who live rough in the parks, uh, on the streets, and uh, some of some of the best people and some of my best friends uh, I have experienced there. Uh, they have taught me so much. Uh, so it's movements movements like uh, the young Christian uh, workers and young Christian students um, are oriented to help this vocation we talk about of lay people to flourish. Uh, these movements provide a real context and a method for lay people to search out and live their baptismal calling. So many of you would know about the See, Judge, Act movement, where we look at a situation, whatever it might be, in our own lives or with the group, and then we judge it against the Gospels as to whether it's good, bad, right, wrong, and whether we should do something about it, whether we are required to act. And if we are, what do we do? And then having done that, we have a review. Again, see, judge, act. And uh, the lay people, uh, this helps them search out that, that baptismal uh, calling. Um, and they provide they provide a pathway to holiness for the lay faithful movements like YCS and YCW. And Joseph Cardine, Belgian priest and eventually cardinal, the kind of the founder of this See Judge Act or Joseph's method, was inspired and challenged by the realities of young men and women of his time. Uh, when he came home from the seminary and met with uh, young people that he'd been with at school and so on, he was, uh, he was challenged by the brutal uh, 
realities that some some people, some young workers, <laughs> have faced in the secular world. Um, he was shocked by the way they were coarsened. I think he said they were made coarse by the reality of their work and the environment. And so, I can remember myself as a young uh, YCW chaplain. Um, we were working with the young men's group and a lot of them were apprentices uh, and some of them were in their later trade and they were confronted by this degrading initiation ceremony in this heavy industry workplace. Um, and the, the degrading elements of these initiation were so abhorrent that some of the uh, new apprentices were actually not coming to work. They were too frightened uh, and, and were putting their apprenticeships at, at risk. Uh, and uh, so this matter became a regular matter for the YCW meetings, the men's boys meeting, uh, where they applied the Sea Judge Act and they looked at the uh, reality and saw that it was... Uh, was it, that it was... Uh, were very, very serious. They judged it as abhorrent and wrong. And then they began to say, well, what do we do? And so they regularly reviewed that, began to form ways of dealing with the problem, um, went to the supervisor, of course, uh, who was totally unhelpful and more or less indicated that, well, this is what happens here. Get used to it. And they realised that Going back over it again, the CJ Jack, they said, but it's so dangerous. Um, it, it was too, too, too lurid to repeat here. But they consulted a doctor about it, and he was alarmed by the practice and said that it could bring real serious lifelong problems for those young apprentices. So uh, with that and the fact that some of them were not coming to work, uh, they continued, of the, continued uh, speaking with the supervisor, but nothing changed. So I was so proud of them. In their utter frustration, these young workers eventually found a very novel but an effective way of coaching the supervisor from his office onto the floor of the workshop where they confronted him with the reality that was facing them. They did it in this extraordinary way, which I won't share with you, but just be, let it be enough to say the abuse of behaviour, this initiation ceremony, ceased. This was the most powerful example of these young workers living out their baptism where they were meant to live it out, right there, in their workplace. And we could say that the church, as Gente says, the church is not truly established, and does not fully live, nor is it a perfect sign of Christ, unless there is a genuine laity existing and working alongside the hierarchy. And so we might be tempted, I suppose, to believe that this lay vocation stuff is is uh, restricted to, uh, you know, the hurly-burly of uh, industry and commerce and all that sort of thing. But at the same time, this group, this same group, this same group of young workers, it was the time when Janet Mead had the rock mass, uh, which was terrific. And so these same young workers said, why don't we write our own rock mass? And what they took on was six months, at least six months, of intense work, study and prayer because they were agonising over, how do we say, Lord, have mercy You're in music? How do we say glory to God in the highest in music? And they worked away uh, tirelessly, prayerfully, uh, developing the rock mass, which was just terrific. And I can remember the cathedral was full. A lot of people come there thinking it's probably going to be awful. 
Um, so they were all perched up on the sanctuary and all sorts of different things and drums and da-da-da. And uh, anyway, look, it was just so beautiful. It was unbelievably beautiful uh, after all this time they would spent prayerfully preparing it. And I can remember, still remember, clearly, people coming to Holy Communion in tears uh, as the hymn was going on. Lord, I am not worthy that you should come to me. And with a haunting rock guitar in the background. And as I say, people coming to Holy Communion uh, with tears streaming down their, uh, down their face at, at this beautiful, prayerful music. These are the same people that were working away getting rid of the initiation for apprentices. And talking of the Mass, can we be reminded that we do pray, Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation. Through your goodness we have received the bread we offer, fruit of the earth, and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Here we are, work of human hands at the very centre of the Eucharist. And so the uh, characteristic of the lay state is a life in the midst of the world and of secular affairs. The laity here called by God to make of their apostolate through the vigour of their Christian spirit a leaven in the world. For the gospel cannot become deeply rooted in the mentality, the life and the work of the people without the active presence of lay people from our gentes. So this is indeed the path to holiness for lay people. Uh, I suppose one of the most inspiring people in my long life was and is a most extraordinary young person formed in the YCW. It was a young lady called Margaret Lee. Margie embraced life and the call to holiness in a way that I could only dream of. Margie was just left school and... Uh, had begun nursing in the local hospital um, in our city. And uh, she was doing beautifully at that. And uh, once she started nursing, a big hairy brother brought her along to a YCW meeting. She was very shy, <clears throat> but like a good YCW meeting, somebody quickly got hold of her and said, hey, you, come here, you can start serving the drinks. And so Marg got involved in YCW, became very much a leader in the YCW. But then during her final year of nursing, uh, she had to travel to Adelaide to complete that final year. And she'd come back to Perry to help us with this big YCW orphanage ball where we raised money for the local orphanage. And on her way back to Adelaide to continue her studies, two hoons racing each other, come round the bend and ran her off the road straight into a, a, a telegraph pole. And being a nurse, she realised that she was seriously injured. And so as people gathered around her, she said, look, when the ambulance come, if I pass out, tell them I think I've damaged my spine. So about two days later, I visited her has already confirmed a quadriplegic laying on this slab in the hospital. Uh, it was the most confronting uh, sight. Uh, and so she was confirmed a quadriplegic, went to rehabilitation as best I could, and then her family rearranged their whole home and life uh, so that they could uh, help her 
with her life. Her only movement that she, she had was her left shoulder. She could just move her shoulder a little and drop it again, but nothing more. And so I used to visit her uh, probably every week at home, take a Holy Communion, have a chat. And uh, I, I was confronted by what had happened and I was heartbroken. And so I chatted with the little kids in our primary school and infant school and told them about Marg and said, what about we pray for a miracle? And they were pretty keen about that. And so the next time I took my Holy Communion, I said, Marg, I've talked to the kids, da, da, da. We want to pray for a miracle. Is that okay? Um, and I thought she'd be pretty anxious uh, to get on board. But uh, she uh, said to me, well, she said, just a couple of questions. Does God know this has happened to me? I mean, I'm not saying he wanted it to happen. Does he know? I said, yeah, yeah, sure. And she said, uh, and does God love me, do you think? I said, oh, no doubt about that, Marg. And she said, uh, well then. She said, what sort of love would it be if I said to him, well, look, uh, I know this is all some way part of your plan, but I'm not going to be part of it. Thank you very much. Uh, just put me back the way I was and let me get on with my life. Um, I had nothing to say to her. I, I didn't understand that kind of deep, incredible faith and love of God. I was just stunned. And I spent uh, the next 20-odd uh, years, I suppose, being stunned. Every uh, youth uh, camp or uh, youth retreat, uh, the first person I'd ask to come with me was Marg. When we do the evaluations at the end of those retreats, uh, what was the highlight for you on this retreat? You didn't need to look after a while. It was always Margie Lee. Margie Lee. Uh, she just changed so many lives. Even when she went to hospital, as she regularly did, often nurses would be seeing her off in tears because they were so touched by the time they'd spent together. And I think it was a bit of 25 years she was in a chair and being a good friend, I rang her and being stupid, congratulated on her silver jubilee. And we had a chat and a laugh. And I said, no, seriously, Marg, I said, uh, after looking at your life, looking back over it, um, what do you think? She said, Father, I would not change a thing. I've had a wonderful life. And so clearly, clearly, we are speaking of a saint here. And I often pray to her and I urge you to, because without date, without any doubt at all, Margie Lee is a saint. And uh, her vocation as a lay person was an inspiration uh, to uh, the next to all the people that met her. Um, I just wanted to come to a, a point. Um, recently, in the uh, in the cathedral here at the end of mass, um, even though there are lots of people in the cathedral, you can sometimes sort of sense that people are visitors, and so. I, uh, I saw this young couple there um, and uh, at the end of Mass uh, I was kind of looking for them and I saw the dad, the young dad and, and his son about, I don't know, 12 or something and I just said to them, are oh, you visiting, are you? And they said, yes. They told me where they are from and so on. And the father said, oh, come and meet my wife and my other son. And uh, they're just outside. So I went outside and there I saw this young woman with a little boy in her arms. I guess he would have been a, actually about four years old, but he was, uh, it was totally stiff in her arms. And uh, I, uh, I said hello to her and she said, oh, this is our other son, uh, called him by name. 
and she said, uh, of course, uh, he can't uh, he can't walk uh, and he can't hear uh, and he can't see and and he can't talk. And I I just uh, felt uh, that I needed to stand just be I felt that I should I just go back to that slide. I just felt that I should kneel at the feet of this family and try to learn what it meant to be truly holy. It was so much for me, like standing in the presence of the holy family with Mary and Jesus in her arms after the uh, dreadful experience of the cross. I envisioned Mary at the foot of the cross holding the body of Jesus. And the love within that family was palpable and the presence of God was inescapable. And I was just thinking to myself, uh, all of us should kneel at the feet of families and learn what holiness, holiness was really about. And then I suppose we could believe that all this stuff we're talking about um, is just uh, old hat. It's for old fellows talking about old times. But in actual fact, uh, that's not true. Um, in uh, in uh, Port Augusta, they are looking at the... Uh, just come back one here. Yeah, thank you. A bit more, thank you. A bit more. Thank you. In Port Augusta, the young YCW group there uh, are looking at how to help international se seasonal workers manage the international English language testing system, commonly known as the YELTS exam, exam, which is such a challenge to newcomers to our country and yet so essential to their life here. And Father Jim Monaghan, the chaplain and parish priest, has a long history of working with YCW, being the national chaplain in the late 1990s. Uh, and this group demonstrates everything that's gospel about the YCW. Miguel, an engineer from Peru, was successful in getting his visa, but Maria, a seasonal worker, knew Miguel and, was, and asked him to help with her YELTS exam. Miguel wasn't sure how to do this, so he attended a YCW action in Adelaide where he learned how others were managing to support each other. So with fellow members Sam, V and Leela, he decided to run a Yelp session for seasonal workers in Port Augusta. Miguel made a flyer and met with his manager and the manager printed other copies and visited every worker, encouraging them to participate. Miguel later involved a cabbie in Georgia in this action, and now the Port Augusta group is running a Yelts preparation class for the seasonal migrant workers from Timor-Leste, Vanuatu, Kiribati. 51 of them meet on a Tuesday night for two hours in a class run by YCW members, concentrating on each of the four modules, the reading, writing, speaking and listening. When Miguel was asked why he and his group want to support these workers, he said, that's what we're called to do. And I guess that makes the call of baptism very real and right now. And so uh, I just want to uh, uh, say that the laity, however, are given this special vocation to make the church present and fruitful in those places and circumstances where it is only through them that she can become the salt of the earth. So thank you uh, very much. Thank you. I thank God for you. I thank you for the opportunity to share with you. I hope it's been of some use. I'm very conscious of taking up so much of your time, but I'm uh, enormously grateful for the opportunity to share some of the inspiration that uh, 
uh, lay people have been to me, starting with my own family, right through to tonight with people like VJ, who have given up his time uh, to help us uh, do what we've done today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you, Bishop Eugene. The thanks are starting to roll in in the chat. Um, and it's my job to moderate the questions and invite you to some further comment for the next few minutes, if that's okay. Sure. Folks, the way we're... Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, folks, the way we want to organise the questions is um, for you to put them in the chat, and uh, there are some there already. We'll ask those in a minute, um, and uh, we'll see how we go. I'll try and group them together, um, and the webinar format doesn't give us much opportunity for interaction between each other, so the, the chat is, is the vehicle. Um, and, yes, if you want to just say thanks, um, please feel free to keep that going. This uh, webinar is being recorded and so the, the thanks will endure. Um, Bishop Eugene, the, the first question um, is one that Pat Branson asked. So Pat, do you want to, as you've got access to your microphone, do you want to ask it in person? Uh, yes, so the question occurred to me, it's occurred to me a number of times, um, principally through my involvement in my parish, but I was reading an article in the Vatican News about an international conference for clergy. And I noticed in there that the, the, the president or the, the leader of the dicastery for clergy uh, was speaking about the need for priests to be accompanied in their ministry. And so my question to to Bishop Eugene, which I think is probably answered anyway, all the way through. Um, but the question was, um, in your experience, um, what are the ways of accompanying by lay people that you have appreciated in your ministry as priest and bishop? Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for your call, uh, for your question, Pat. I think clearly uh, all sorts of ways, but one of the ways, particularly as a young priest, the way I was invited into families um, mm. and just sat and observed was incredibly helpful to me. I, my very first parish uh, on my own was the first time I'd ever lived on my own. And I thought this is going to be dreadful. But within a week, I was uh, part of uh, families all through that parish. Uh, they looked after me and I learned from them what it, what it was like to pray, what it was like to be faithful, what it was like to uh, suffer tragedy and maintain your faith. I've worked with all sorts of people in preparation for marriage courses and uh, marriage enrichment courses where uh, I've had my part to play as a, as a composite uh, in, but the vocation of marriage was clearly the work of married people with whom I worked and provided my input. And uh, I learned so much from them about all of that. And uh, I suppose too, in the way that people in families manage all sorts of difficult things like children who fail in all sorts of ways, um, children who don't live up to the standards that the parents would have hoped. And I just read a beautiful thing from Wendy Wright, who's a theologian in America, uh, the, what she's finishes up saying about mothers and families. She says, you must always remember, must always remember, no matter what, you have got to say to your child, wherever and whatever their age, come as far as you can, and I will come the rest of the way. What a beautiful thing to say. And I think it's a model for the church. And this woman, as a mother, talks about loving children. I think as a theologian, you'd have to be a woman and a mother to speak the way she does. And I find it just inspiring, particularly that part. Come as far as you can, and I will come the rest of the way. Don't come halfway. 
Come as far as you can. You can't come any further than that. And I will come the rest of the way. I think it's a beautiful motto for the church, really. Um, and, 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 it's, and it's something, and one more thing I've learned from, from working with lay people, I guess. Now, they're an absolute inspiration, Pat. Yeah. Thanks very much, Bishop. Thank you. Bishop, one of the themes um, in talking about lay people is about empowering people to understand their own capacity for holiness. And Pauline Kennedy um, has asked a question that's related to that, I think, or it's it's about um, acknowledging um, and lifting up. Um, so Pauline's uh, question is that, or comment and then question. She says the Productivity Commission rep spoke today about the lack of any sort of real First Nations power. The question is, why doesn't the church really prioritise giving members a true account of the First Nations in Australia and the right to self-determination? Why doesn't the church distinguish between party politics and the justice issues crying out for address? So in light of lay vocation, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think that's an enormously big question and uh, uh, it's it's not I'm not able to to address it as it ought to be here, but just to say that I think the very first thing, and perhaps the most important thing that the church can do, is listen carefully to Indigenous people. Um, they're not always listened to, and a lot of their uh, criticism. Oh, excuse me. A lot of their criticism or their anxiety in my time with them is that so they would say, Bishop, we know what to do, but uh, we need help to do it. And I say to them, well, why don't you get the help? And when they talk about help, they say that they, they go to look for help and often uh, whilst they present what they believe will work, uh, the the authorities then decide not that, but they'll do something else. And then when they do something else, that fails and it reflects on Aboriginal people. So there is a big opportunity here for governments and the church, for everybody and every one of us, to listen carefully to the realities of anybody's life. That's the truth. And if we don't listen to the reality of Aboriginal lives, uh, we will never get we'll never get any solutions. We must listen carefully uh, to the truth of the lives of Aboriginal people. What their elders understand are the answers to the problems they have, and then work closely with them to help them implement the things that they know will work. Um, I mean, it's a massive area, massive thing that. That I, I couldn't answer any any better than that. I think in the short time we have, but it comes down to an av ab absolute reverence and respect for Aboriginal people, and to listen carefully to what they say and to what they know to be true. It's a, a like a kind of pay attention. The first first part of the of the review really see like listen see pay attention. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. There's a, there's a cluster of um, concerns that I want to try and pull together. Um, so Anne Jennings has made a comment about how often um, ordinary people don't give themselves credit uh, for the contributions that they're making. Um, uh, and uh, Stefan Gigach is saying um, we need more lay saints and how do we work in the church to encourage lay people to really discern their vocation, like to get a sense of what people are called, called, really seriously called to do in living out their baptism. Um, so I think those, th 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 and others are saying similar things, like how is it that um, a serious commitment to living heroic, holy lives can be made mainstream and visible in uh, the contemporary faith community. 
Yeah, I think it, for me anyway, uh, I try always to, in homilies or whatever, I would try always to begin with uh, the reality of family life. Um, because I think most of the lessons we learn and the things that uh, mould us uh, it happens in family. Um, you know, I can remember, you know, my idea of God coming from a simple and almost a silly example, but in the country where we lived, uh, everybody went to the dances that were on, and uh, as a little kid, you'd be dragged along and put under the under the supper table on a rug and go to sleep, and at the end of the night, you'd be picked up and taken home. And I can remember this night after getting home, my dad carried me in and put me in bed. And he must have said, you know, go to sleep. And uh, I kept getting in out of bed. And eventually he said, look, what's, what's the matter with you? And I said, I haven't said my prayers because the idea was you'd kneel by your bed and say your prayers. And, and I can remember my dad, it would have been a lot for his sake as well, I think. But he said, no, look, he said, you've been a very good boy. He said, God, it's cold outside now. He said, God would want you to just snuggle up in your bed and say your prayers quietly in bed. And I remember thinking to myself, what a beautiful God. He understands me and he loves me. And I'm, and I'm sure my dad thought, now I can go to bed. But it came from the family and also all the example I saw from my family. And I try as a priest, always heaven as a bishop, to say that family is the, is the school of virtue, is the school of holiness. If we want to learn how to be holy, that's where we learn it. And so as a priest or a bishop, I think you've got to give first priority to how do you bring dignity and importance and listen carefully to families. If you're going to do one thing, do that. And I think that'll cover 90% of it. So there's a few questions that uh, cluster around the difference between priestliness and family. That is part of some people's experience. Um, so Kim Crawford's asking, what skills or strategies can you suggest to constructively challenge conservative pastors? Um, uh, question about um, princely... Uh, younger priests, why has seminarian formation lost its way? Why is it about um, separation from ordinary life? Um, how can we best, Anita Devine is asking, how, can, how best can we help our parish priests to delegate responsibilities to lay people who would like to serve in their communities? So there's a whole, um, there's, there's interest in um, how the priest and the people can work together and mm. how lay people can encourage um, can encourage a priestliness that, that acknowledges lay vocation. Be keen to hear your yeah, thoughts Yeah, that's, on that, that's a, an enormous subject, isn't it? And it's an important one. It's an absolutely mm. important one. But to some degree, I think priests have never needed families more than today. I say that because I have the privilege of giving lots of retreats to priests around Australia um, and in some overseas. And there is, a, there is a certain malaise in a way among priests at the moment because of the public con the conception that uh, I've had of priests because of the sexual abuse thing. Uh, and there is a sense in which priests feel isolated and perhaps withdraw um, and a bit uncertain of themselves. And all of this plays into uh, a role that uh, is not helpful. And so I think, you know, my advice, my for whatever it's worth, on retreats to priests is that you go and, and sit with families. You go and sit with families. And, of course... People would say, well, I just can't barge up to families, and that's true. So families now have an immense role, I think, in forming priests. Are you not going to, families are not going to uh, form priests 
by avoiding them or criticizing them. Uh, invite them into your home, into your life, into your prayer, uh, into the things that concern you at work, at home, uh, with not being able to have children, having children, having children that disappoint. Invite the priest into the reality of family life. It's no good to isolate them. And pre priests are a bit isolated at the moment. They feel isolated uh, because they are unsure now of how people see them uh, and all of that. And I can understand that. It's an awkward position for them to be in. And I think they're not going to, that's not going to be helped by them sitting in a kind of a, a withdrawn, uh, elevated uh, situation. So I think families have never had a more important role than they have now in forming priests. Uh, and I would like to see families, much more families invited into seminaries uh, where they share with, uh, with the seminary training uh, the reality of family life and uh, prayer and all of those things. It's, we're working as a team. And we're, if you don't work as a team in any situation, it's not going to work well. And there's some really helpful comments in the um, chat too about um, the people who are single, people who are not part of um, married families. Um, an invitation, please, to comment on the vocation of single adult people, people who choose to be single. Um, and a question about, I think it goes to the question about how seriously discerned vocation applies to all the baptised and all circumstances. There's also a question about um, the laity in PJPs and this new canonical form. I guess that's perhaps a more institutional focus, but the, the sense of um, uh, how, how, how the single people within the church um, also operate as part of this, this team. Right. So uh, I think that uh, adult, single people, men and women, have an extraordinary role to play uh, in, in the holiness of the church. They have an opportunity to do things that no, generally no married couple can do because they have different calls on their time. Um, but a single, particularly, not particularly, but some single professional people have a particularly useful role to play in uh, elements of parish life. Uh, but uh, I think all single people have a particular um, gift, in, and that's the gift of time. Now, I'm not saying they're not busy, not saying that, but I'm just saying they don't have a vocation uh, which involves them in uh, being at home every night at four o'clock, get the whatever, whatever. They are... They are freer to be who they are and to use their gifts, uh, not only in a parish, uh, but in working with uh, uh, people who are, who, are, who are in need, whether they're disabled, uh, whether it's AA or similar uh, operations where people need help. And people would like to help, but some of them are too busy. But I think single lay people, it is a genuine vocation and it's not just that they couldn't get married or it didn't work out or, you know, the fellow went away or she didn't like me anymore or whatever, so I gave up. No, single life is a vocation. There's no question about that. And I, we're coming to the, the last couple of questions um, that we can ask, I think, um, interested in... The, the chat is very rich and um, people there are talking about synodality, what it means to be walking together and the, the vision that offers, um, the reality that family life can also damage people and that there's a need to integrate that awareness. Um, and the, the um, comment that's come from Ellen and Brian Smitty uh, is perhaps an interesting one to end on. Um, they're saying that um, the use of the words lay and laity means lesser, you know, means not professional, means 
amateur compared to serious in most contexts, except the church. They're saying that we are all the people of God. Can yes. we find a more inclusive word apart from lay and laity? I've puzzled about this for years. I'd really like it if you could um, I think the, the people word of laity. God. Yeah, yeah, I think the people of God is a lovely term, um, you know, because that's all of us, isn't it? And mm. it doesn't differentiate. And uh, we don't need to differentiate unless we are wanting to make some point about the difference. <clears throat> Otherwise, we're just making making a difference. Uh, we're all a family of God, surely, and we're one in baptism. Mm. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, I forget the first part of this last thing you said. I was going to make a comment. Uh, oh, yeah, about damaged in families. It's absolutely true. We learn all the good things about ourselves and about life in families, and we can be damaged unbelievably in families. And that's why I think a priority, if you're talking a priority for the church, it has to be the family. It has to be the family. Because we just like that person or people were saying, the family is a, a place where such damage can be done. And so anything and everything we can do to make families a peaceful place where people have dignity and good work and a sense of uh, a sense of their own importance and goodness, nothing's more important than that, it seems to me. And it's certainly true that some of the greatest good happens in families and some of the greatest harm. Thank you, Bishop. And Patricia Sharkey's just suggested the baptised is another way of referring to... That's a lovely the, way of saying um, it. ...all the people of God. Yeah. The, the difficulty comes when you want to make the distinction. Like, yes. You know, yes. That, that's, that's, right. that's where the, the, there isn't, a, like, ordinary or something doesn't, doesn't no. really cut no. it. No, no. Um, I think it, there's a linguistic problem to to work on. Good, good. Myself. Um, it doesn't fall to me to offer the full uh, vote of thanks and conclusion. I'm throwing back to Stefan to bring this plane into land. But I do want to say thank you very much, echoing the people in the chat. Over thanks, to you, Catherine. Stefan. It's been lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Catherine. And yes, I will. Um, it is, does fall to me to say thanks to Bishop Eugene. It's been a wonderful presentation and also chat or, and questions and discussion. And you've really raised a lot of issues that, uh, in fact, in many of the questions are not just for you. <coughs> oh, excuse me. But I think that a lot of the questions, in fact, rebound onto us as lay people or as people of God, as the baptized. In all those capacities, I think many of the questions are challenges for us to take up. And actually, as the Australian Cardinal Institute, we are trying to develop a way to sort of respond to some of those issues. And I've just put into the into the chat there a link. Uh, we are planning next month to have a follow up to this uh, event in which we much more of a discussion sort of format uh, from which we hope to draft some kind of a submission. As you know, many of you will know the Senate is on right now. Um, the Australian Church is calling for submissions at a parish and diocesan level, maybe national level. So we hope to draw together some of the points and the issues possibly that have been mentioned here tonight, maybe others that you might like to raise. So it's an invitation to you to join us next month for the follow-up to this event, which will be a, a, a discussion session led by Paul Lenton. And uh, that's the next step for us. But, you know, really it's been wonderful listening to, to Bishop Eugene. Frankly, I think somehow you a little bit underplay your own role in this. Um, I think when we hear those stories of the YCW in where it was at Wayala or in the Port Perry Diocese and people like Margie Lee, I I remember what Cardine said, um, how much the, the YCW depends on the role of the chaplain. And those stories tell me also what a great uh, role you played as chaplain to those groups. And I really hope uh, that this is exercise tonight has been a way of passing on um, some of that uh, experience to a to a new generation. I think we really do need to train not just young priests, but also youth ministers and teachers and all those who work with young people 
to learn how to accompany other young people in the way that you've done. So I'd just like to thank you very much for being with us tonight and to invite you all again to join us next month for our follow-up program. Thank you very much. Thanks, Stefan. God bless.